think it is um, it's, it's time. Uh, others who have not yet joined will find us on the way. Um, I, I take the opportunity and pleasure to welcome all of us on this call. And uh, this is our second call in 2019. And uh, those of us who didn't attend the first one, I, I, I say Happy New Year. Uh, we hope this, this year is going to be great. Uh, we at this time we shifted the, 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 the operation center to Zambia. We are in Zambia. Uh, uh, Dr. Tandy and myself, we are in Zambia, so that's where we have the control center at this moment. So this center keeps moving. Wherever we go is where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we want to thank the Zambian team that has given us great hosting. And um, all of you, I welcome you on this call. Uh, I will, uh, without wasting a lot of our time, today we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Lala from WHO as our subject matter expert. She's going to be tackling a very uh, timely topic on how to optimize monitoring uh, as we optimize ART uh, regimens. You know, there are new ARVs coming on, uh, on, on, on the list, and they may require uh, another level of monitoring. We want to hear what WHO has, uh, what advice it gives before countries start grappling with what to do with their monitoring. Otherwise, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is going to be uh, quite a, a session for us to get updates on, uh, on, this, on this subject matter. So, Dr. Lara, you're welcome. Um, I will ask you to take up uh, the floor now, and uh, you'll be, I think, sharing your slides. Great. Okay. Thanks so much, Charles, uh, and welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Lara Voinov. I'm the Diagnostics Advisor uh, here at the WHO in Geneva. Um, and so responsible for a number of things, but in particular developing uh, our guidelines and revising guidelines uh, as the evidence and, and country policies indicate to us. And so we agree that this is a very timely issue. We know that a, a number of countries are starting to think about whether they should revise their viral load algorithm. And so we are um, actually ongoing or about to start entering into a guideline process and are likely to have a guideline development meeting early next year um, to see where this movement should go for viral load, but for in general, in general in diagnostics, uh, treatment, service delivery, et cetera. So I will now try to just share my presentation. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about treatment monitoring and some of the considerations, as Charles was hinting in particular, as we're thinking about optimized ARVs. Obviously, you know, there are a number of regimens that are being used right now. Uh, we could change our algorithm based on these current regimens, but we think it's also really important to think about uh, what are likely to be used in the future, as of course we want to make sure that we're implementing uh, the policies and the guidelines in the best possible way for countries. So we thought it would be informative or helpful to start by talking about some of the momentum around viral load scale up and how that's gone over the last few years. Of course, in 2013, we came out with a strong recommendation for viral load testing for monitoring patients on treatment. In 2016, we, we stayed with that strong recommendation and also brought in a little bit of nuance that I'll touch on really quickly. But what you can see is that a number of countries, including in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, in the dark green here, have fully implemented the guidelines as recommended. And this is of mid-2018. One thing to note, however, are, is that there are still a number of countries uh, shown in the light green, particularly in uh, West Africa and a little bit in East Africa, are still only partially implementing the recommendations as suggested. 
And so we still have a little bit of a ways to go in terms of, of scaling up, fully scaling up viral load for treatment monitoring. And of course, I think we're all well aware of the 90-90-90 UN AIDS targets, and that viral load is very well linked to the last 90. Well, another way to look at this, and we, we have seen that the last 90 has gone fairly well uh, in terms of viral suppression when we think about patients who are HIV positive and on treatment, but of course, it's also important to think about uh, the viral suppression rates of all patients who have HIV. And that's what this figure is essentially showing. Of course, we know that the first 90 were reaching at about 75% of patients knowing their status. Of all patients with HIV, only about 59% of them, uh, and that's actually quite a significant increase from the last few years, are on treatment. So we still have a little bit of gap in terms of making sure we reach that second 90 and the first 90. And then of course, of all HIV positive patients, about 47% of them are virally suppressed. And of course, this is a, a factor of both the first and second 90 uh, and some of the gaps we see there. But really just an indication that we need to continue uh, to put forth our efforts in terms of, of supporting the 90-90-90 and particularly the, the last 90. When we look at how viral load scale up has gone, and this is a forecast that was developed by Chai, We've seen significant scale up, like I said, over the last few years since the recommendations came out in 2013. In 2017, about 14 million viral load tests were done, and we do expect this to continue to increase over the next few years, upwards towards nearly 35 million tests being needed in 2022. But of course, what you can see is in the clear bars or in the white bars are the proportions of unmet need. In 2017 and 2018, we still see that only about 50 to 60% of patients are accessing viral load, which really indicates that we need to continue to move forward and really prioritize increasing access to viral load amongst, in particular, low and middle income countries. And I think a number of us are well aware that in 2017 and 2018, a lot of these volumes came from uh, three or four high burden countries that have really scaled up their viral load, including South Africa, Kenya, and Uganda. And so taking those um, proportions out of this type of a figure would indicate that in countries outside of those, we really need to start expanding access to viral load testing critically and quickly. Now, there are a number of increasing options that exist in, to support uh, on the technological side increasing access to viral load, and that includes use of both conventional laboratory-based instruments, near point-of-care instruments that exist, future point-of-care instruments that are coming on board, as well as different sample types, including dried blood spots, plasma preparation tubes, and, and others that are, again, coming onto the market quite quickly. There are a number of WHO pre-qualification technologies, and we've listed them here, and ideally we'll see a few more of these for example, like the Allier M. Pima. Roche has some new assays that are coming onto the market as well, like the 6800 and 8800. And ideally, we'll see all of these moving towards getting regulatory approval, pre-qualification, of course, market entry. Because then, of course, that gives countries uh, a, a number of options with which to consider based on their context of how to scale up in the best possible way for themselves. One of the recommendations that did change around the viral load algorithm or the viral load consideration in 2016, however, was the consideration to use dried blood spot specimens. And this was based on a systematic review of which I'll show you the details in a minute. But effectively, the results suggested that, um, <coughs> that dried blood spots can be used to do viral load testing. Of course, plasma is still the preferred and ideal strategy if possible but that these dried blood spots could be used uh, at the same threshold as plasma at the 1,000 copies per ml. And these were based, the, this recommendation was based on, on these data that came out in the systematic review and hopefully will be ideally published in the next couple of months that shows quite solid performance for a number of technologies in being able to accurately classify patients as failing or not failing treatment based on that 1,000 copies per ml threshold. And in the yellow stars here, I've indicated those technologies that have WHO pre-qualification listing, and you can see that their performance are quite strong. 
there are a couple of technologies that perform a little less well and have quite low specificities. And obviously we want to really caution the use of these technologies. And for Roche in particular, because of these results, we saw a shift from them in terms of the DBS protocol and a move towards their free virus solution protocol. And fortunately, what you can see here is a imp significant improvement uh, in both in, in, this, in the specificity in particular with that technology. Now, both Abbott and Roche have also developed additional protocols uh, that can be used. Abbott developed a one-spot protocol that has since received WHO pre-qualification listing, and some of the preliminary data are quite favorable and seem to look quite similar to this two-spot protocol data that we see in this table. Roche has also re recently received WHO pre-qualification listing for their plasma separation card, which is quite a, a good move. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. And, and ideally, we'll hopefully see um, some programmatic data or some clinical evaluation data for that technology in the coming months. Now, of course, all of this is to say you know, we have, like I said, a number of options that can be used in order to scale up uh, viral load testing across countries. And really, hopefully, a, a number of these can be mixed together to provide you with the best possible option because really we want to start expanding access to testing. But at the same time, it's important to think about uh, and to applaud ourselves in the terms of the viral suppression rates that we see. And these come mostly from the FIAs as well as national dashboards. And what we see is for those patients who are on treatment, we, we see quite significantly high viral suppression rates, generally between about 85 to 92% across a number of countries, including those that perhaps are not as advanced in their viral load uh, national programs as others, but indicating that the drugs are quite successful and we're doing a good job of, of ensuring patients are, are on treatment and relatively well retained in order to achieve these numbers. Now for us, on, on the, thinking about the last 90, about viral load, how we can support monitoring patients on treatment, of course, one of the most important pieces that we really want to keep in mind is making sure not just that we're running a lot of viral load tests, we're expanding access to viral load, but also that patients are receiving that test result and that clinicians are able to make decisions based on that. What we see is that we, we've had some challenges in this. Um, over the last few years. And these data can come from a few countries that are a little bit further along uh, in their national scale up processes. In the gray bar, the proportion of viral load tests that are done. In the blue bar, the proportion of viral load tests that were elevated or above 1,000 copies per ml. And what you can see in the orange bar, or really you can't really see it because the orange bars are quite small, are the proportion of those patients who should have gotten a second viral load, so all of those blue patients, who actually moved through the viral load cascade through adherence counseling and received a second viral load. So this really indicates that of those patients who are failing, only about 10% move through the cascade uh, and are actually getting a second clinical viral load. And this indicates that probably even fewer are actually then switched to second line who need second line. And so really one of our big pieces, at least of the WHO, are trying to encourage countries not just to scale up viral load, but to really make sure that these viral load test results are all being used for, to make clinical impacts for patients. And these data we also see uh, are similar to data that came, came from uh, a study by MSF as well, and so relatively consistent across countries. So those are sort of two of the biggest pieces from our standpoint in terms of, of just moving forward towards scaling up access and then of course using results. But now when we start to think about is the algorithm that we currently have the best possible algorithm uh, for the future? And one of the key pieces that we've been thinking about quite a bit are around these optimized ARVs and these new drugs that are starting to come onto the market or are already on the market. And one of these drugs in particular is this first one, DTG, called dolutegravir, that uh, uh, ideally a number of you should already have heard about because they're starting to be scaled up in a number of your countries. <coughs> we released some guidelines last year suggesting dolutegravir can be considered a preferred first line. And what you see, especially when you compare it to the second column here of efavirenz, which are the, uh, the previously preferred regimen, is that number one, dolutegravir has a very high barrier, genetic barrier to resistance, much higher than efavirenz, but also currently 
systematic reviews have looked at the, the amount of drug resistance seen um, caused by, by dolutegravir. And what has come out that is that patients who are on dual or triple therapy, no one yet uh, has experienced any drug resistance to dolutegravir. And there are about half a million patients across the world who have been on this treatment uh, for a number of years now. Of course, there are some lingering issues around the use of dolutegravir in women of childbearing age. Uh, but at least on our standpoint, we'll be entering into a guideline session in June to really look at this a little bit further and determine whether we can move forward there. And then, of course, another key difference between these two drug sets um, is that dolutegravir has few drug interactions, especially compared to efavirenz. And this is a key piece linked with the drug resistance piece in that patients may be able to take dolutegravir. Uh, they're more, it's more tolerated, uh, and it's a drug that perhaps patients can be on for a significantly long period of time. And we've started to see uptake now of dolutegravir in particular. Uh, and this, you know, like I said, recommendation only took place in the middle of 2018, but you're already seeing a number of countries moving forward, not just in putting dolutegravir into their national guidelines as their first preferred first line treatment, but a number of them are already starting to initiate procurement and moving towards uh, implementation of this as their uh, first line treatment. And we'll see uh, likely significant movement over the next few months as uh, PEPFAR countries are entering into their COP season. Now, when we start thinking about the algorithm again, I just wanted to provide some of that background to provide you some thinking on our end in terms of, of what the viral load algorithm look, should look like. We are thinking about this in the context both of patients who are on efavirenz as well as patients who are on dolutegravir. Number one, trying to think about whether there's an algorithm that would fit all patients, um, but also trying to keep an open mind and understand whether we need to be thinking about uh, more than just uh, one algorithm for these different sets of treatment regimens. <coughs> so when we look at our um, viral load algorithm, our treatment monitoring algorithm, I won't go into too much depth because I'm, I'm sure that you're all well aware of it, but just to keep in mind that uh, currently we still have a threshold of 1,000 copies per ml to indicate possible treatment failure Patients are then meant to uh, receive a second test after adherence counseling at about three months. And for those who still have an elevated viral load should then move on and be switched to second line therapy. Of course, the first viral load we recommend at six months after treatment initiation. The second one then should be done at 12 months and, and yearly thereafter. And when we take a look at uh, country policies uh, of this algorithm, we see fairly consistent uptake of our treatment failure recommendations. And you can see here that nearly 50% of countries uh, follow the recommendation as we see fit. For the, most, for the rest of the countries, as you see here, uh, the majority of the changes are really just adding additional viral load tests on. And that's potentially within the first two years, but there are also some countries that are doing six monthly rather than yearly viral loads. And I think on our end, um, we would, what our recommendations state is, is really the minimum that we're suggesting of countries in order to, to monitor. But for those countries that are keen to do additional viral loads, uh, we think that that's uh, just a fine response to move forward. And so some of the questions that have come up over the last few months um, is whether or not we should think about and consider doing an earlier first viral load in order to try and better identify those patients who may have transmitted drug resistance. So they've acquired drug resistance potentially through, um, through their partner. And so would increasing or bringing the first viral load closer to ART initiation, potentially try and identify those patients who just have drug resistance and may not be able to suppress on their current regimen. Some suggestions have thought about moving to one or three months for that first viral load. Uh, and there have been some indications that perhaps um, it is likely that you may identify drug resistance in patients who are still elevated at that time point. Um, more so than you would at six months, but there are some data and a number of studies are coming out um, that are looking at the time to, drug, to viral suppression on different sets of drugs. And what we're showing here, what I'm showing here is, study from, is data from the dolphin study, in red is uh, 
the Dali Tiger Brewer Regiment, and in blue is the Faverns Regiment. And what you can see, I've noted that the first green line is at that one month time point, and the second green line is that, that three months time point. And essentially what you see is by one month, um, more than 50% of patients still have viremia in both of those regimens, just because it does take some time for patients once they start a regimen to bring their viral load down to undetectable. So having that first viral load uh, at one month is a little bit concerning because it would un incorrectly identify 50% of patients as failing when really their, their viral loads are just still coming down and it's taking a little bit longer. If we moved uh, the viral load to three months, again, potential that it could uh, identify patients more quickly than waiting until six months after ART initiation. But for those patients on efavirenz in particular, we still see upwards of 30% of patients still being a little bit viremic on the way down uh, to suppressing their virus who could potentially be mis in incorrectly identified as failing treatment if we were to move up that second, that first viral load. So we're a little bit cautious at this point, but I think we're looking to collect some of the data over the next year to really understand the clinical importance and relevance of um, an impact of potentially moving that first six months uh, viral load earlier. But I will say currently we're still uh, a little bit cautious in moving forward there. Another suggestion from some groups is that potentially switching um, patients to a second line treatment could happen um, after a single viral load. And so those patients who have an elevated viral load just after that one viral load um, would be switched to second line. I think as you can imagine, there are some concerns there. Of course, you know, it would be at, in, at that point essentially impossible to determine who is elevated because of adherence and who is elevated uh, perhaps um, by drug resistance. And that is why we, we currently put in that second viral load check. And so we're consolidating the data here as well, but I will say that we're very unlikely to move towards this direction of suggesting that a single viral load uh, be considered before switching patients, partly because we are seeing relatively high programmatic resuppression rates. So essentially that elevated viral loads are often caused actually by adherence rather than being by drug resistance. And there's a systematic review that we've commissioned that is just being finalized now. And of course, this is very relatable to the introduction of dalutegravir, as I was talking about, which has no observed drug resistance. And so in, in considering or encouraging a switch of treatment after one elevated viral load would likely be a very um, perhaps incorrect or unimpactful way to move forward with patients on dalutegravir. It is the best of class drug that we know of right now and has no drug resistance. So we'd be switching patients off of the best drug onto a suboptimal drug with this type of an algorithm. So like I said, we're cautious, um, but we do want to see any of the additional data that may exist um, before making final decisions. There have been a number of countries, and one of the key pieces that we're starting to think about is whether the algorithm should be a little bit adjusted for pregnant and breastfeeding women. And this is particularly for pregnant and breastfeeding women who have been on treatment for some time, because you can imagine that only getting yearly viral loads could mean that we miss the entire pregnancy of a woman. Maybe she got her last viral load two months before getting pregnant, so then she's not due for another one until just after delivery. <laughs> and we do actually suggest that viral load testing can be done in the recommendations in our guidelines um, in order to support identification of high-risk infants, perhaps, who may need then enhanced prophylaxis. And so we're currently reviewing some of the study data as well as national policies and practice to determine if we should be considering an ANC or maternity-specific viral load in order to support reduced mother-to-child transmission and to be able to identify those infants at high risk. And so some considerations would be whether we should ensure that there's an antenatal viral load, perhaps a delivery viral load, and or a postnatal care viral load. And so we'll be reviewing as much as we can to really notify uh, where the best place um, for a MTCP viral load could be. And of course, I know that you heard a few months ago around point of care viral load, and that's also something that we've been thinking about and really following to determine whether we should be considering a recommendation for implementation of point of care. We will say that I think at this point, um, the, some of the primary value that we see around point of care viral load, and effectively the difference here would be 
between point of care and the lab base is simply that that patients would receive a quicker viral load result. And we see some specific populations where this could be quite relevant. For example, in pregnant women and breastfeeding women, as we were just discussing, um, could benefit from a, a faster viral load in order to then determine their treatment course, but also uh, the treatment and prophylaxis course of, of the infant as well. Infants and children are another key population in the sense that we know that they have high drug resistance rates. And so switching or getting them off a nevirapine-based uh, regimen may be far more critical um, than the general population. Patients with advanced disease who may be uh, particularly sick um, and, and in need of, a, of an improved regimen could benefit from a quicker viral load result. Those who are suspected of failing, so perhaps those who are needing that second post-adherence viral load, especially if they're sick or re-entering care, for example, um, may benefit from a faster viral load in order to more quickly switch um, to second line or just in, in order to more quickly move towards adherence counseling. Um, and such practices. So right now, we don't have a recommendation to use point of care or near point of care technologies for treatment monitoring, but we are very closely following some of the impact studies and implementation pilots that are ongoing. I will indicate though that we do uh, strongly suggest that countries that, are, that have technologies that can what we call do multi-disease testing, so perhaps um, the, the Cepheid Gene Expert, um, there are a couple of technologies like the Abbott M2000 that can also do TB testing soon, um, should be considered to integrate um, early infant diagnosis and viral load onto the TB platforms as well for more efficiencies. Now, finally, one of the last pieces that we're thinking about when we go back to our algorithm and where some of the changes could be considered is thinking about whether or not the treatment failure threshold, this 1,000 copies per ml, is still the best threshold to consider for patients. I think many people are likely aware of a study that came out um, a couple of years ago now from South Africa that looked at low-level viremia rates and found that patients with low-level viremia may be more likely to have drug resistance than those who are undetectable. I think one of the things that we would obviously consider is that patients with any virus perhaps would be more likely to have drug resistance than those with none, but we really are trying to understand and and see if additional studies will come out to really provide the clinical impact of this potential phenomenon. When we look at the policy review, and again, this comes from some of MSF's data, what we see is that about 60% of countries are still using the WHO recommended 1,000 copies per ml threshold. There are a number of countries that are currently considering or are, have, are, have moved to lower thresholds. I will note, though, in particular, that a number of the countries that you see that do utilize lower thresholds are those in Latin America and Asia that actually only use plasma as their primary and only sample type to, do, to use for viral load testing. And this is important because in a lot of other countries, as I was indicating in the beginning, viral load access is still quite poor. And we want to make sure that we can improve access because we know some of the sample transportation issues that we've seen. And so we're thinking about low level um, viremia and the treatment failure threshold in the context of a number of dis different issues. And one of them is in the potential use of alternative technologies and sample types like droid blood spots, like near point of care and point of care technologies, because we want to make sure that if any threshold changes, we can continue to provide support to countries using these alternative um, sample types. And what we're showing here is just to really indicate and emphasize that countries and this, the reliance on these alternative technologies like dried blood spots is quite considerable. Uh, and some countries in Eastern South, Southern Africa will rely on, all, on these alternative sample types like DBS for over 70% of their patients. So if any new uh, threshold is to be considered, we want to make sure that it can still be used with DBS, with plasma separation card, with uh, point of care technologies, or else we really could be limiting the amount of access that patients could have uh, for viral load. And this is really nicely illustrated in the next couple of slides, where we look at um, where some of the viral load labs are across countries, 
And what you see is generally they're in the urban settings, and these are some four different uh, country examples. And the rings around each of the urban centers are essentially the geography and the patient centers where samples can get to the lab in the required manufacturer specified six or 24 hours worth of time. And so those patients who, who go to facilities outside of these rings, unfortunately are very unlikely to have their specimens reach the lab within that required time period. And as we know, some things are not always so perfectly um, set up and, and there are likely to be facilities and patients within these rings who also unfortunately cannot get their samples to the lab in that required time period. But luckily we do know that a lot of the patients seek care in these urban centers. But I think one thing in particular that we really want to highlight from this slide is the sliver in green here. So similar to the previous um, slide with the DBS access, what we see is about 50% of patients potentially won't have access to viral load testing or can't have access to viral load testing if only plasma would be used and offered uh, for their countries. And so it's important obviously in every country to really look at this a little bit closer and to understand whether or not um, the technologies you're using and, and the sample transportation networks can provide plasma access to all within the six or 12, 24 hours as indicated, or if these alternative technologies are needed and to what range. So when we think about um, some of the key challenges and concerns, particularly with considering um, reducing this treatment failure threshold to below 1,000, the first piece that we really want to think about is blips. And the reason why we initially implemented the 1,000 copies per ml range was to eliminate the potential for this very natural but non-clinically relevant phenomenon where patients effectively have these blips in the hundreds of copies per ml that are actually clinically meaningless. And this can happen everywhere and it does happen everywhere. And essentially we just wanted to make sure that, that these blips were not misinterpreted as clinical failure or potential treatment failure. Um, and so lowering the threshold would essentially then potentially um, have patients who have these blips uh, be considered for treatment failure when in fact they're, they're just uh, a phenomenon that we see. Like I said, we want to make sure that some of these alternative technologies like DBS and point of care um, can still be used and, and technically possible to be used at any lower threshold. And we're doing some reviews right now to look at this a little bit closer. Of course, if this is a, a real phenomenon, um, we also want to know if this is a real phenomenon for patients who are taking dolutegravir. So like I said, a lot of the um, global excitement is around really implementing and scaling up dolutegravir significantly. And because of the lack of drug resistance, we're very cautious and really a little bit unsure that low-level viremia is an actual clinical uh, uh, concern for patients who are on dolutegravir. And then finally, there have also been um, some data that will likely come out in the next few months that have actually indicated that samples that have been stored incorrectly, so they've either potentially been um, stored for longer than the 24, six or 24 hour time point that, rec that manufacturers recommend, uh, may actually be causing these low level viremia results seen. So patients who should be considered um, undetectable because of this incorrect storage or poor storage are actually coming up as low level viremic. Um, and so perhaps that indicates that it may just be an artifact and not necessarily clinically relevant. And so we're trying to balance these and really get as much data as we can over the next few months and year to inform us in the best possible way. But we will say that we're very cautious uh, for countries to be moving towards lowering their, their threshold. Um, and we would suggest limiting that type of a change, particularly in countries that really still need to be scaling up access to viral load and ensuring clinical utilization of viral loads. And I will just hint at, at the bottom here, um, <coughs> why we also suggested use of the 1,000 cutoff per 1,000 copies per ml threshold initially. And I know that there's some of the U equals U um, platforms that are coming out that are indicating or suggesting concern for this threshold in terms of, of potential transmission. 
Well, studies have come out, and, and this is the, one of the seminal studies that came out a number of years ago, that essentially showed that transmission is very, very unlikely um, when your viral load is less than 1,700 copies per ml. So we took that data as well as the blips data and came together to really determine that patients that had less than 1,000 copies per ml were likely um, more often than not just blips and artificial phenomenon and were very unlikely, uh, very, like I said, very, very unlikely, less than 0.01% of a chance to transmit uh, to, to any partner. So again, I think we really um, are taking some of these results with quite a bit of caution um, and really uh, suggesting potential limited changes until additional data are collected. So just to conclude quickly, um, we wanted to touch on, uh, just to highlight that again, plasma is the gold standard that we recommend. And we really, you know, if you're going to use plasma, ensure that transportation can happen within six to 24 hours. If that's not possible, of course, there are several alternatives that could be considered like dried blood spots, plasma preparation tubes, uh, et cetera, that can be used to really supplement and optimize your system in order to expand access. And of course, that's the most important right now is, is really increasing that access so coverage can be above the current 50 to 60% rate in some countries, as well as improving clinical utilization. I know that ASLM is really moving forward in nice force on encouraging and, and trying to support better clinical utilization because we can do as many viral load tests as, as possible, um, but without actually using the test results. We're, we're not servicing patients and clinicians as best as we can. And so those we would suggest are the two priorities. And then while those are happening over the next year, we're reviewing some of the, um, the current treatment, the, the, the data that are coming out, both from countries as well as studies on how to inform the future treatment monitoring algorithm. And again, we really are thinking about the best way forward in terms of how countries are moving in their treatment regimens and thinking about whether and how do we um, rectify this and provide the most optimal treatment failure uh, algorithm for those drugs that are likely to be in use and, and primarily in use in the next two to three and five years. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you and, and open up for any questions. And on, on this page here, you'll see a number of links that we've provided, um, both for viral load resources and some of the recommendations um, that have come out, as well as uh, we thought it would be helpful to include some of the references and recommendations around dalutegravir in case you're interested to really understand this drug a little bit more, um, what some of our recommendations are, uh, and how we're suggesting for countries to transition to this treatment. As, as some of you may be aware, there are a number of groups, PEPFAR included, um, that are really pushing forward on, on moving towards Dalutegravir given their lower, its low cost, its high genetic barrier, et cetera. So we thought it might be useful um, to provide some of those resources as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Lala. That was quite informative. And um, bringing the focus back again to what we should be really focusing on now, because there's been a lot of, a lot of discussion and agitation around, you know, the monitoring and the, uh, and the cutoff for treatment failure and the kind of at the expense of scaling up access, as well as utilization of results. Where we want really to have focus is how do we make sure, if we are at around 50 to 60%, how do we ensure we push this to 90 or 90% plus? And how do we make sure that all these data tested eventually get their results and their results impact care? So we, we want to, to rejig uh, the, the focus back again onto those two uh, uh, focal areas that we feel uh, from the reviews and, uh, and assessments we have done with countries that these are needed areas that need to be focused on. Thank you very much, Dr. Lara, for bringing these updates and reassuring us that still the cutoff, the 1,000 cutoff is still relevant and uh, even as we optimize ART. 
Otherwise, uh, I would want to open up the discussion to questions. I know you've been pushing questions to the chat, and uh, if you have not yet, you can do that. There are people monitoring the chat that I would want us to read out the questions and the reaction to the presentation. Please, uh, Nicholas, can you do that? Yeah, yeah we have, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lara, for the presentation. We have uh, a couple of questions in the chat, and uh, the first one is from uh, Thomas from Uganda, and he's asking, uh, have you explored the factors influencing country modification of valid algorithm and stroke or the lack of modification? That's the question from Thomas. Then the other question is from Dr. Pasco, and she's asking, uh, should countries adopt their list of recommended minimum testing packages to also include POC bioload at lower level? Would this contribute to improve access to bioload testing? That's from Dr. Pasco. And then we have uh, a question from uh, Laura, and uh, she's asking, uh, since, we know that vast, since we know that vertical transmission can definitely occur at lower bioloads, i.e. between 50 to 1,000 copies per mil, has there been any consideration of lowering the bioload threshold, especially in breastfeeding women or pregnant women? And then uh, the other one from uh, Nafi is, uh, given the poor performance of some DBS-based technologies, is there data which indicates utility <coughs> of consecutive bioload results for a single patient from the different technologies? And then the last one from uh, Zin Drovu is uh, he's asking, uh, has WHO done evaluations on the new Roche plasma separation card? What is their recommendation on its use, given its slightly better performance than DBS, especially with the near introduction of DTG and the need for better performing sample carriers? I think you could first answer those. These questions are in the chat and all of us can access them as Dr. Tala answers them. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, so I'll attempt to answer them anyway. Um, but taking a look at some of the questions, the first one around the factors <coughs> implicit countries uh, and their modification of the viral load algorithm or lack of the modification, I think it is definitely something that we'd like to look into a little bit more and understand um, how countries are, are thinking about moving forward and making some of these adjustments. I know that in previous conversations, particularly at ASLM's uh, lab community of practice that we all attended in Uganda uh, late last year, um, some of the, the future modifications at least came up and those are really helpful conversations in thinking about our future guidelines. Um, but it is important or it will be really useful to think about sort of the lack of modification uh, in some countries. And we, we have had some conversations with countries to, to try and understand this. Um, Pascal's questions around um, adapting the recommended minimum testing packages to include point of care viral load at lower levels. I think at this point, at least from our standpoint, we don't have a recommendation specifically on point of care viral load. Um, I think we're looking to see and, and better understand some of the data and we know that ongoing that studies are ongoing that will be really informative in how we move towards making a recommendation in early of next year potentially. Um, but I think, like I said, you know, there are some populations that really could consider point of care viral load um, in order to provide some of that support. And I think we would encourage countries to think about how that would fit in their system. Um, and how you know, that may support some of their key um, patient populations. If they have, for example, uh, relatively high rates of patients with advanced disease, point of care viral load could be very useful. If maternal to trial transmission is still a significant issue, perhaps point of care viral load can support um, such of those re uh, reductions perhaps in terms of being able to um, identify mothers who have elevated viral loads or have vi viral loads and may uh, transmit to their infant. And so being able to provide those moms with better adherence, making sure that they switch to second line if they need to be on second line, as well as putting infants, if, they're, uh, if it's a high-risk infant, then on enhanced prophylaxis. So we, uh, we do see a potential role of point-of-care viral load, and I think countries would, be, um, would, would benefit from thinking about that within their context as well. 
So moving on to Laura's question around consideration of a different threshold, uh, specifically for pregnant and breastfeeding women, I think it would be helpful for us to understand um, because we know that transmit vertical versus horizontal transmission can be different, as you're indicating here, um, that vertical transmission can occur at these lower viral loads, whereas we don't see that as often at, um, with horizontal transmission. Um, I think we'd be open to looking at these data and thinking about whether the threshold needs to be different for these different populations when we think about vertical versus horizontal transmission. Of course, I will just say one of the other pieces that we've really been moving towards, and I think some countries may, may have seen this and partners on the early infant diagnosis algorithm, is that we want to ensure that any algorithm that we put together is relatively straightforward, relatively simple to apply and to implement. And so I think that's especially why we're being a little bit cautious in moving forward in this process, because we want to make sure that the algorithm is used, that the clinical results are used, because that could potentially be one of the reasons um, why patients aren't switching as, re as frequently as we would expect. So we want to keep that at the back of our mind to ensure um, that it's something that's the most implementable. And so, of course, having various different treatment thresholds um, could be a little bit more challenging in the field, but I think we definitely want to think about that and, and see uh, if the data are compelling. Um, so. Then on to Anafi's question around um, some of the performance around DBS um, and whether it would indicate utility of consecutive viral load results for a single patient from different technologies. Um, I will say in this setting, you know, I don't think, at least in our standpoint, that we would classify DBS performance as being poor. Um, there are a number of technologies that uh, are able to identify patients to 95% sensitivity and specificity. And when you think about viral load being used in an algorithm, of course, um, as well as being a repeat viral load for those patients who are still stable and undetectable, um, you know, the risks of missing patients are not as high as you would think about for a diagnosis, for example. And so, um, so we do see the use of DBS to be quite, uh, or should be considered by countries. Uh, and when we made that recommendation, we did actually do a modeling exercise to understand some of the risks and benefits of recommending a technology that per perhaps wasn't the ideal technology like plasma. Uh, and what the guideline development group determined <laughs> was that, and some of the performance of DBS at that time when we went through the recommendations in 2015 were actually lower than what we see now with some of the regulatory approved assays, um, that the guideline development group did determine that even some of these lower performance standards uh, from the dried blood spots at around 85% sensitive or specific, for example, would still reduce um, morbidity and mortality in those settings particularly because without the use of dried blood spot, for example, patients would, would rarely have access to viral load at all. And so that's why uh, we made that recommendation and moved forward um, to suggest that, that DBS could be used. So when we move on to the plasma separation card, um, the WHO has now listed it for uh, pre-qualification. So it is available for procurement with our member states. We don't have a specific recommendation on the use of, of plasma separation cards, and I'm not sure that would be something um, that's discreet enough or that's clear enough to provide a clinical programmatic um, recommendation, but could fit into, for example, the recommendation around the use of, of alternative um, considerations and technologies like dry blood spots. Um, we have seen like I said, and, and we could go back to the slide that showed the performance of dried blood spots, again, that are, that are quite strong. And I think we've seen that the plasma separation card has relatively similar performance. Um, so not sure whether there's, there's sort of one or the other. Um, but as you indicate, it would be interesting to look at um, the performance and, and the utility of all of these different alternative technologies when you think about value scale up. Um, interesting question um, for the next one around the transition to optimized ARVs and what the future means for viral load testing effectively, um, whether it will become a test to check adherence. Uh, and, you know, I think at least in an ideal world, um, from our standpoint, 
yes, I think essentially viral load could become an adherence testing tool if the profile, the high barrier to drug resistance profile is maintained with dolutegravir. Uh, we have seen a little bit of drug resistance for patients who are on dolutegravir monotherapy. Um, it's still relatively minimal. Um, but, you know, there is always the worry that maybe some drug resistance would, would happen for patients who are on dual or triple therapy with dolutegravir. That said, again, we haven't seen any yet. It's been a number of years and, and thousands and hundreds of thousands of patients. But if we don't ever see drug resistance to dolutegravir, um, then effectively that kind of, um, this kind of viral load test would essentially primarily be an adherence check. Um, and so thinking about how to move forward with that would be, would be an interesting piece. And then Z from MSF um, asks a very good question around, would we consider um, a different strategy essentially for patients with advanced disease? And for each of these different pieces, I will say that we're, whether it's the switching off with one viral load, a different algorithm, a different threshold, um, an earlier first viral load, we are looking at a number of subpopulations to see if um, algorithms should be adjusted based on all these subpopulations. And of course, advanced disease is one of them. Um, but again, sort of back to Laura's question, I think we also want to make sure that the algorithm that we put forward or the algorithms that we put forward are those that can be used and are consistently used. Viral loads are being provided and, and clinically provided to patients in the best possible way. Um, and this, if there's a simplified way to do that, to also make sure that we are ensuring that patients are being switched appropriately and quickly, um, then that would be ideal. And again, I think, you know, it's, it's also a little bit context dependent on, you know, what are the proportions of patients with advanced disease in each of these countries? Does it warrant are the benefits outweighing the risks in terms and the harms of, of using a different algorithm for those sets of patients? And so I think we're very keen to look at the data over the next year on what that um, would look like and think through possible models for um, notifying how we'll move forward with some of these different algorithms. But ideally, uh, I think in an ideal world, we would love to be able to move forward with one optimal um, algorithm that could be implemented in a variety of, of scenarios, but I think we also know that that simplicity may not rule um, the day in this case. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lala, for responding to those questions. Uh, I, uh, I wonder, Nicholas, do you still have in the chat, we could accommodate another two to three questions before we go to our announcements, okay? The questions are done in the chat. Okay, so if anyone you have a question, you can put up your hand. Uh, we can pick on you if you really have a question and you had not uh, put it in the chat. Just uh, you can put up your hand and then we can pick on you. Okay, so if there are no questions, it seems Lala has done just to the subject. So thank you very much. I think we wouldn't get a better person to talk about this. Uh, uh, being uh, the advisor at WHO on diagnostics, I think she's really best uh, uh, placed to advise and to give guidance and what is coming in the pipeline. <clears throat> but the carry home message is that there should be no panicking at this point in time around the cutoff and around uh, the monitoring whether uh, we should, uh, I mean, change the uh, uh, the, 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 the cutoff uh, in light of the new drugs that are coming in. Uh, research is ongoing to inform the decisions that have to be made. If there could be context based decisions that are done uh, within the context of the country's program, but from a global level, no guidance to this effect has come. Uh, fourth, and 1,000 uh, 1, cutoff is still very safe for us as we continue monitoring our patients. So we want to continue putting our focus on ensuring that we scale up uh, the access to viral load so that we get over 90% of our patients who need to actually have a viral load done, have it done as we speak now globally, at least within the sub-Saharan Africa, we are around 50, 
Of course, a few countries are doing better than others, but we should all pull through to ensure that access is increased, and that is very key. And then the other bit is utilization of results. Uh, for us to continue testing and we count numbers of tests does not make any difference until these results are able to enter into the patient charts and actually are used in time to actually uh, impact decisions that are made in the interest of the patient. That's where our focus should be. And as uh, LabCorp, this is where we put our focus from the meeting that we had in Uganda and doing uh, an analysis of the assessments uh, that, came, that was done in, uh, in, 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 in the community, uh, in the countries within the LabCorp community. We found these are areas, these two areas are areas that every country needs to focus on. And uh, we've been doing uh, our COP19 planning, We've been really on your case. You remember we've been checking on you, how far you are engaging with a co-planning uh, uh, team within in country. And uh, we've been sending out some tools that uh, you could use to make the case and make sure that uh, this particular tool, and when we talk about this tool, we are not saying they're the only ones. But at least within all the efforts that we are doing, if we do all the others and leave this out, you know we'll not be doing uh, just to the efforts because if we do the testing but the results are never used for patient care, all that effort uh, 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 is drained to nothing. So uh, we continue to make our, our appeal that continue the engagement with your country teams. I know the COP planning, COP19 planning is ongoing. I know uh, it could have gone to the regional level but yeah, to the regional meetings or about to get there. But even when, if you are part of the team going to South Africa, to Johannesburg, for the regional meetings, still make the case there. We sent you a matrix that we generated in the Uganda meeting that breaks down the different areas of consideration that countries should consider or programs should consider to ensure that we improve result utilization and to also ensure we improve demand creation or increasing access to viral load. And these are areas we really need to put our energies on. And when the regional meeting ends and the, 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 the country plans get back to countries, let the discussion continue and, uh, and put nothing to rest until uh, sufficiently you see that in, within the country action plan, country operation plan, uh, your action plans have been properly reflected. And there are sufficient activities or strategies that have been captured that will ensure that access will improve and that will ensure result utilization will improve. Um, there are a couple, I know we have just begun the year, we are working on quite a number of things. Uh, for you, we will be telling you in the course of time we are still cooking up things. So it's not yet ready for us to tell you what we have in the pipeline regarding the program, the program that we have for the year. But uh, uh, there are a lot of good things in the pipeline coming. So um, I, I want to, I wonder whether Dr. Pasco, you have something to say? Charles, no, no, thank you. I, I would like to thank Dr. Voino for the, the very nice presentation, the good attendance. Uh, I just want to remind the country team that we put a lot of resources uh, on our LabCorp uh, webpage uh, to support their COP planning for demand creation and result utilization. And I can see that there are a few very interesting questions in the chat box. Can we uh, just continue the discussion on the WhatsApp platform? Uh, Dr. Nicholas will just transfer those questions and Dr. Voinov can, can, can help answering those questions or any country that also has experience. Your input is very welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, just uh, uh, continue engaging. Uh, you know, our message is we should not lose the opportunity. This co planning uh, uh, season does not happen. Uh, all the time, it is only now, and if we don't do it now, we miss out. And you remember this country operation plan is beginning October, so the whole full year, if we do nothing, nothing will happen in regard to these areas where we need to see that we move our viral load agenda 
to another level. Uh, I know you have your country plans. You, we've asked you to send us your country plans. And I want to thank all countries. Uh, uh, we, we still have one country only, uh, which, is, uh, which is DRC. That has not yet given us their country plan. Uh, Southern Sudan has done and all other countries. So we have the action plans. We are beginning to actually uh, uh, work, uh, look at these action plans and we'll be monitoring and be checking with you on the progress. Not all, not all activities within these action plans need budget. Some of them don't need budgets. We would still be able to do something uh, around some of these action areas without necessarily having a budget to do this. So for those areas that could be done without waiting for the COP budget, the, COP, the, the country operation budget, let us begin working on them. We'll be continuing the check on you to ensure that the action plans that we developed eventually turn into tangible deliverables and impact the intervention uh, of our viral load monitoring by improving uh, access to viral load and also improving results utilization. Use the tools that we have sent to you lately uh, as you engage with your country team that is working on the action plan. Make sure your voice is heard. And if you really need any advocacy, any form of support, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We will do what it takes to reach out to who needs to be reached out to ensure that you're supported. Thank you very much. And uh, you have attended this session. I think it has made the record. We have been well above 100 members on the, on, 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 on the platform. Let us continue passing out the message and let all other people come and we learn together. Thank Have a great, and, and we want to send greetings actually. We are in Zambia. You see, we are like in a big stadium. <laughs> These people are really powerful. They have given us a real, a real treat. Eh? <laughs> they have given us a real treat. And if you are not careful, we may, we may get stuck here. <laughs> <laughs> but we want to thank the Zambian team uh, for being very hospitable, for being very uh, good. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Tandy and me, we are here. We are given red carpet treatment. Thank you very much. Nice time. Let us continue the discussion on WhatsApp. Bye. 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 Bye.